This week marks the 31st anniversary of the outheist that shocked the world. In the early hours of March 18, 1990, two men dressed as policemen buzzed the side doorbell at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. Within seconds, the door was quickly opened by the night watchman. When inside, the two men posing as police officers quickly tied up the two night watchmen and brought them to a secluded area in the museum's basement. They then went on to commit the largest art heist in the history of the world. Although authorities may have made many have, have many leads and suspects who may have been responsible for this crime, 31 years later, the paintings have not yet been found or seen. On today's show, we will take a deep dive into what happened that night and who may be and, may, and who may have been responsible for the most sensational unsolved art heist in history. The gates at the Isabella Gardner Museum will stay locked while authorities search for clues in the daring weekend heist. There are some significant paintings missing. As by significant as a couple of Rembrandts and a Vermeer. And the ballpark figure on the cost is about $200 million. Officials say the museum's elaborate surveillance system made no difference. Two men wore police uniforms and fooled the security guards. They were allowed into the building. The two security guards were cuffed and the uh, theft then occurred. Besides the fear of damage to these works, considered among the most precious by the old Dutch and French masters, museum officials are also stunned by what the theft does to the museum. We are an unusual in that we are a permanent collection, so we do not um, buy or sell works of art, so we really are not concerned with their monetary value in that they are priceless in our eyes. The FBI says there might have been other accomplices in this theft and have widened the search internationally. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. All right, guys. My guest this afternoon, Stephen Kirkjian, spent nearly 40 years as an editor and reporter for the Boston Globe. During that time, he won three Pulitzer Prizes, as well as being one of the founding members of the Globe's investigative spotlight team. In the early 90s, he also played a very prominent role into the investigation of the clergy abuse scandal inside of the Boston Archdiocese and the devastating Rhode Island nightclub fire as well. He joins me on the show this afternoon to talk about the infamous Gardner Museum art heist in the fascinating book he has written on the theft called Master Thieves, the Boston Gangsters Who Pulled Off the World's Greatest Art Heist. Um, I'm such, so fascinated by this this uh, this heist. Um, I'm thrilled to have this gentleman on the show this afternoon, Stephen Kirkjian. Stephen, first of all, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure. It's my, my pleasure to be on with you, Michael. Uh, Stephen, in 1981, a small-time thief named Louis, Louis, or Louis Royce, um, Louis. He, he, he got pinched on a, on a job he did in Newton, I believe. With another right. gentleman, uh, I know the last name Rossetti. First name escapes me. Um, well, and he told the, he told them when he got pinched. He said, "Listen, you know somebody's gonna they're gonna hit the museum, the Gardner Museum. They're gonna hit it eventually." In fact, what happened? You know, it, like it was it was a Louis. Uh, I befriended Louis. He was getting out of jail, and he told me the story. And he said uh, we had uh, uh, I had uh, I had cased a house in Newton that had some uh, D- uh, Salvador Dali art in prints in it. And I loved, he loved uh, Dali. And uh, they uh, set up, or the family was away, they set up uh, a, uh, a theft of the house and they hid the museum, they hid the, I think, 12, 15 pieces. Uh, they hid them in a house in uh, um, either Revere or East Boston, one of the Rosetti. And uh, they were going to find the perfect fence uh, who would buy the art. Well, uh, Louis effed up, and the perfect fence turned out to be a perfect FBI agent. It's amazing uh, how that and happens. As he was trying to, he was trying to woo the the FBI the fence into believing that they could get good stuff. He said to him, "I, we, if you like the stuff that we got here, I've got an idea for hitting the Gardner Museum. Let's go through it." Take a look at this brochure. You tell me what you want, and I will get it for you. And, uh, well, 
before they could, before long, a month or so, they busted him for the uh, for the theft of the Dali prints, and they the FBI went over to the museum, uh, the museum and said to them, "You better watch it. You better look out. the The bad guys know how vulnerable you are." Right. The mu the museum took some steps for the security, but they didn't improve the quality. Or uh, they they didn't pay enough the guards that they had, especially right. the night watchmen they had, and that's what the fatal flaw was. I mean, you're only as strong right. as your weakest link, and uh, right, the people right. whom they had on that night were were not very uh, were not very committed to security. Yeah, they were, they were, uh, not that they right. were involved. It's never been, it's never been shown that anybody on the inside was involved. Uh, but uh, these guys, the one fellow was uh, was a rock and roller, and he loved he loved the job because the job didn't begin. He was a night watchman, began his job at midnight, and he loved, uh, he could play whatever band he was playing in. They could rock all late night, and then he would come off the stage at midnight, and he would get a cab over to his job at the museum. And he'd show up stoned, or he'd show up drunk, but he said it didn't matter. No one, no one, you know, right. nothing ever happened. Exactly, <laughs> I, exactly. You know, I, I would go in, you know, I would sit at my desk, <laughs> and not, no one would ever knock. Uh, March 18th, and, uh, 1990, right, two it, guys did not. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to, Stephen, so, you know, the FBI did mention to the people at the museum, the, in the, you know, the people on the board saying, listen, you know, you, there's been rumors that there might be, you guys might get robbed, blah, 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 blah. Yep. And yep. they may be impersonating police officers. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, well, obviously the guy, that the gentleman you just mentioned, um, so why don't we just talk? Why don't we get in? Why don't we get into March eighteenth, nineteen ninety, uh, roughly right. around one one thirty in the evening? Right. Um, excuse me, in the morning. Exactly. Um, try to set that up a little bit if you can, Pete. Uh, Stephen. Absolutely, Mike. Thanks. Thanks for opening it up for me. Um, now, March eighteenth is uh, early morning hours, uh, yeah, around one thirty. Uh, there is a. Uh, it looks to the a couple of kids who are leaving a late night party at the apartment building uh, on Palace Road, they see this car, this um, hatchback, with two men in it, both dressed in police uniforms. Well, one of the kids whom I interviewed said uh, he was from Charlestown, and which you know, uh, coming from Boston, uh, Charlestown kids know, uh, you know, police procedure. If right. cops are dressed in a uniform. They're not in a, a small hatchback. They're either, they're either in a police cruiser, a uh, marked cruiser, or an un, a Crown Vic. Right. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're detectives. A, detectives. They're, they're detectives, but they knew something was wrong. And he went closer to the uh, he went closer to the car, but his girlfriend was with them. Reminded him that they were both drunk and they were both underage, so they they, they left. They left the um, uh, they left uh, the street. And they never got the number plate, which was unfortunate. A couple of minutes later, the car uh, drove closer to the uh, front door, excuse me, the side door, employee's entrance on Dallas Road uh, of the museum. Two men came, got out of the car, uh, both dressed in police uniforms, uh, and rang the side doorbell. So uh, they, um, there is a, uh, it's, it's 1.30, like I say, and in the morning, it's uh Understand, this is a few hours after, you know, St. Patrick's Day has closed down. Uh, so, you know, the bars are maybe just closing down. And I think these the robbers picked this night particularly because they knew the cops who were on duty would be patrolling the city, would be on overtime. You know, they mm. would have had the double shift. And I don't think they would. they thought they wouldn't be as alert as they otherwise would be. So, you know, just to give them a little bit of a break, but they didn't need a break because the fellow who was at the security desk, he look, they have a closed circuit TV. It's shining down on the two police officers. He has worked that shift for a year and he knows he's not supposed to let anybody in. And these two guys say, are saying, we, we're police, Boston police. We're here to investigate a disturbance. Let us in. Now he knows he's been told. Never, if they say they're from police department, you call 
911 right. and right. tell them to send a cruiser. But don't let anybody in. But uh, the fellow who's, you know, he's not, he wasn't stoned. He tells me he wasn't stoned and he wasn't drunk. Uh, but, and he thought it was the cops. What he thought what had happened was that when they, he had been right through the museum that for the previous hour, he knew there was no disturbance inside the museum. But what he thought had happened was some kids had jumped, jumped over the back fence. The museum had a, had like an iron fence in the back. And, uh, he thought some kids had jumped, jumped over that back fence and were screwing around in the backyard of the museum. So, and he, so, so he makes two grievous errors within two minutes, which allowed this theft to happen. The first one, he buzzes them in. He buzzes them into through two, two sets of security doors. And now they're two guys dressed as Boston police union come in right in front of him at the open security desk inside the museum. And they only say a few things to him. One of them is, who else is here? And he says, there's another security guy doing the rounds. Call him down which he does. He gets on the two-way radio, calls his, his partner down. That partner had never, had only worked the shift. He had never, very rarely, he knew, he, he, had, he was a regular daytime guard. In fact, he knew the, the he knew the job was so boring, he was a <laughs> trombone player. He had brought his trombone with him to, uh, to practice that night. Well, he wasn't going to be practicing that night. The second thing they say to the guard behind the desk is step away from the desk. You look familiar to us. Come out from around that security desk so we can get, so we can see you fully. And he knows if he steps away from the desk, he's going to leave the one alarm that the museum has to the outside world. It's a emergency alarm. Right, and right, right. if he presses that button, the outside world, the alert would be on to the police and the security the security firm uh, that the museum had uh, on the outside of the museum. So, but it's the only way if he leaves it, he now nullifies its entire security system. There was no other, there was no other way to alert the world. But when they said to him, you look familiar to us, do we have a warrant for your arrest? He knew what they were saying. He thought, but they thought he thought they were mistaken in his mind. He says, they mistaking me for some other thief, some other robber, <laughs> some other somebody who they're, they're cops. They must have a warrant on a guy who looks like me. So he steps and I don't want to be arrested because he knows this is now early Sunday morning, one thirty Sunday morning. He knows if they pinch him, even if it's for mistaken identity, he's not going to get be freed from a judge until Monday afternoon. And what he has in his pocket like I said, he was a re- big rock and roll fan. He, what he has in his pocket is a ticket to that night's concert in Hartford, Connecticut, Sunday night's concert in Hartford, Connecticut, that the Grateful Dead was putting on. And he loved the Grateful Dead, and he didn't want to miss it. So he does what the cops, alleged cops say, and he mm. steps away from the desk, and the next thing you know, they got the cuffs on him, and they got him against the wall. He knew right away. It was because uh, they didn't frisk him. They just put him right, up against right. the wall and put the cuffs let me, on him. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Stephen. Did, do we know if they, no, these, I, these two alleged police officers had had weapons? It's not gun. known. It is not okay. known if they had guns. Somebody has told me that they may have had stun guns, but I, I have never heard that. I've never heard and that they, they had. had a, and they had an issue. And they had an issue with their mustache. He had an issue with. They kept on. <laughs> pressing his mustache and <laughs> the belief is that they both had fake mustaches on interesting the boston police reports show say that they the two men had those in the old days the cops were allowed to wear, put pins you know if you had a marksmanship pin you're able to put that pin on your collar boston police patrolman's association they had a pin you're able to put that on your collar the 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 uh, the uh, police report said these men had those pins on their collar, so they had done some work on what a Boston cop looks like, but they also had disguised themselves with these phony mustaches. And, and you also uh, say, and you also and you also say, Stephen, it's a very important point that you know 
They did their work, but they also probably know, knew that the buzzer would be, was behind the desk to have him come yes, from around the desk. That's why they said to him, get out from behind that desk. Right. So and they must they have staked the joint. Had they reached over to get him or gone behind, he would have had his finger on the right. button. Right, so so they must so they must have staked out the place in the past. You know, they must have staked out. They must have had some information. Right, right, about right, right. right. You're right. Absolutely right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. So uh, they tie them up. They bring them downstairs, and the next thing you know, um, uh, you know, they have the whole house to themselves. Uh, oh. You know, uh, you know, they have, like I said, they have the whole place to themselves. And they spent about an hour more, uh, all told, 81 minutes inside the museum. Uh, but they could have spent all night. Uh, right, the, right. And they go right to the room where the masterpieces are. Um, and that is um, the Dutch room. It's on the second floor of the museum. And uh, they stay there uh, for a while. But they there, but they take... The um, they take down the major masterpieces. They take in the end thirteen pieces of art from the museum, but really only four or five at the most can be designated masterpieces. But they're the masterpieces of the ages. A one, there are two very large Rembrandts. The only time Rembrandt usually po painted portraits. The only time he painted the sea was a painting, a biblical scene, Christ in a storm on the Sea of Galilee. It, it's a majestic painting. Uh, and uh, the, uh, th that was on the far wall of the, uh, of, of, the guy, of the Dutch room. They take that down. They break the, the glass front, and they cut it off of its stretcher, which gives, me, hmm. uh, which gives the, the investigators a big clue. Of so what they would what these guys were there for they were not there to get this these paintings to sell them to a doctor you know to to a to a person this was not a a heist on that had been commissioned by a person right. who wanted the paintings because you, they treated the they broke every frame they Amazing. cut the masterpieces out of their out of their stretchers and so there had to be some other reason and the more right. i uh, more the more reporting i did on this uh for the globe and then for my book uh, the more i got told that the uh the uh, the, the theft of, uh, of priceless art uh, is for a get out of jail free card uh, right. the belief is i mean you can you can you can uh, you can uh, bargain it and compromise negotiate with the uh, with the insurance company, if there is an insurance company, uh, in this case there was no insurance because it was too expensive. Uh, uh, and uh, you know we could, you know we could, uh, you know, if there was a you could bargain them on a dime for the dollar. At the time that the artwork was estimated at two hundred million dollars, it is now estimated at ab around a billion dollars worth wow. of art. Amazing. The, the you know the, I mean you cannot you cannot buy these Rembrandts. There's a Vermeer. Vermeer only right. painted uh, one maybe thirty five thirty six paint times, and one of them's exquisite painting, very important Vermeer called the Concert, and that too was stolen out of the museum. So um, yeah, you know, so, Stephen, you talked so, you talked about these guys. I mean, you know they lock up the two. Night watchman, they they tie him up yep. with duct duct tape, you know, handcuff Thank him, you. whatever they did, and you know, you know, when you watch a movie, if, if, an art heist, you know, it's very pristine. You know, they get their gloves this on. This is not pristine. They, That's a very good point, Mike. This was this was brutes. These uh, guys were like a bulls in a china closet, and this this is exactly. not garbage. You, would, you know, this is. No. I mean, no. It's, no. once in a lifetime art. artwork. Exactly. Yeah, you you you're lucky if you ever get close to this, this artwork. And these, right. and these individuals were treating it like it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, dish rags. And you say in the book, Stephen, they, they, they walk right by a Michelangelo, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. You know, and that's very interesting is what happened in that room. That's the uh, on the second floor as well. 
uh, there is a, sh- uh, a, a room called a short gallery. And in that gallery, and this is, as you said, did, were they in there before? Did they pay for the museum before? And the, my, this is my sense is that they had because, excuse me, what had happened that um, the, they went for a banner, like uh, like a flag, like a s- small American flag. It wasn't American. It was a Napoleonic banner. Napoleon had actually carried this banner in battle. Wow. So it was an important piece of historic, you know, uh, antiquity. And it was in a frame, glass frame, with eight small screws screws holding the the the, 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 the frame together. They they got six of the screws out. They couldn't get the last screw out. Interesting. They didn't break that glass. They left it there. But huh. the banner was on a flagpole, and the top of the flagpole. If you look at flagpoles in most schools, there is something at the top, and that's something right. we call a finial. Right. And usually, it's a ball. Sometimes it's an ornament, and sometimes it's an eagle. And this one had a golden eagle. It's called a finial, F-I-N-I-A-L. And this golden eagle, they took that. And uh, when they stepped down from the uh, chest that they were standing on to try to get the uh, to try to get the uh, Napoleonic banner out of its frame, they came face to face with a wall of larger paintings, larger frames. And one of those frames had five Degas prints, Edouard Degas. And uh, and the the prints may be worth $100,000 to total. They would not finish pieces. They smashed that frame. But some of the prints were uh, were of a um, horse racing uh, image. And my sense is, bad guys, maybe like horse racing, they stole that. They broke the frame, and they grabbed the, the sketches, and they took that. But three doors, three doors, three little panels away is an actual Michelangelo. Uh, it wow. would have taken some work to get it off the wall, but they went to spent minutes to try to get that Napoleonic banner. Uh, after, in my sense, is after they got the Rembrandts and the Vermeer, they, they were this there for a treasure hunt uh, and, uh, you know, for whatever caught their eye or had caught their eye. Uh, interestingly um, enough, what I call it, the, the, the mystery within the mystery, there is a painting that was taken from the first floor in um, Blue Room. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, a lovely little um, uh, 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 painting uh, by Monet. Yeah, Manet, excuse me, Manet, and, uh, and it's called the Shelley, C-H-E-Z, Tortoni. It's a painting of a, it's a profile of a man. And uh, the problem with the taking of that painting is there is no indication that the thieves went into that room. How do they know that? And that's this. The museum had in place what is called a motion detector machine. And it, it, it was. It had a little bit of a computer, even though it was 1990. Uh, they, it had a little bit of computer um, memory right, to right. it. And as the bad guys, anybody went through the museum when this uh, equipment was on, and it was on that night. It registered what room you were in. Where it was in the door jams of, as you go in and out of the rooms, you could, you if you went into a room, it would register you on this piece of equipment that was back at the security desk. They never see, they see the, the bad guys during those hour and a half inside the museum. They see them back and forth. They see them coming in. You know, it registers on the machine that they came in. It shows them at the front desk. It shows them upstairs. It shows them in the Dutch room. It shows them in the short gallery. It shows them back and forth, back and forth. It never shows Amazing. them in the short gallery. Excuse me, in the in the in the blue room. Yet M&A. there's a painting oh. missing from the blue room. It's a you know it's the mystery within the biggest mystery that uh, yeah. that and, the city you know, does. Uh, another funny mystery, Stephen. Um, you know, you talked about they were there for about an hour and a half. You know, up and down, up and down, up and down, destroying 
stuff everywhere, but they found time, like you said in the book, to, to go to use the vending machines. How do we well, know that they uh, use the vending machines? Is yeah, that that's a myth? A, thank you, Mike. You, you did a good job of reading the book. Um, <laughs> the, dep- the now late uh, deputy security director, uh, he had never been interviewed, and I called him, um, uh, and he said, I'll, try, go for, I'll tell you everything I know. The next morning, that morning after the theft, when I realized the theft had happened by 6.30 in the morning, the second shift had come on, and they couldn't get inside the museum because the two guards were downstairs tied up still, they called him at home in Somerville, and he hustled over there in his car, and when he arrived, he came in through uh, the back door that he had a key to, and he, it, it was in the basement area. And there was a vending machine there. And I said, close your eyes, close your eyes, and just walk me through. What do you see as you go through? And he says, oh, Jesus, I see it. There's a candy wrapper by the... And I said, well, what, why is that significant? He says, Ann Hawley was the museum director. She was so meticulous how she wanted the museum kept. You know, you couldn't have... If there was, you know, a wrapper on the floor, even while the museum was open, you know, you, you would have to clean up, whatever. She wanted the museum, because it was a whole place. She wanted it to be meticulous. So she said, he said, there's no way that they, the, the, the guards would have allowed that to be there. It had to be taken by one of the bad guys, that they had maybe, you know, gotten a candy bar out of the machine, maybe put a quarter in or something, and uh, gotten a candy bar and, uh, and uh, left the wrapper on the floor. Uh, uh, f- fascinating, fascinating, Steve. I, I want to circle back a little bit, if we can, sure. uh, real quick before the before the whole crew showed up and found out what happened. Um, so you know the thirteen paintings, Stephen. You know these are not like Bobby Orr posters. You just roll them up and you put them under your under your arm and you walk out the door and put them put them in a car, trunk somewhere. You know these are huge pieces of artwork. H- how did they transport these? You know these these art this paint paintings to ve- well, their vehicle. A, what what was their vehicle? We, uh, that's again, uh, part of the mystery, Mike, uh, there is, there was never, uh, at least from the information that the authorities has given out or reporters like myself who have been able to find out, there was never a second car. It was only that one hatchback and they, uh, they, they left the museum in two five minute segments. Uh, they, they, they carried the stuff out again. They didn't bring any of the frames they had taken the, and they, you know, rolled the paintings up and they presumably how, how did, stuffed Steve, them in the back of the, of the, uh, of the hatchback. Did they, did they come in with screwdrivers and bolt cutters or anything? They did, must did, have had, that's a good question. That's a good point to have gotten access to that small screws, small enough screws, uh, for the, the polionic banner. They didn't realize that they had stolen the finial or they had tried to get the napoleonic banner till like later that week someone was vacuuming and uh, oh. they uh, by the uh, in the short gallery uh, just to clean up before they let the public back in and they click 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 got picked up by the uh by the, whoever was vacuuming and they realized oh my god they tried to get the banner look at that the finial is gone because the original story said 12 pieces were stolen. In fact, it was 13. They didn't le- realize the 13th finial was taken until um, later, until, you know, later that week. And, you know, I don't know. You know, there's so many parts of this. Right. Uh, that, uh, you know, you, that you know, just as well, you, you know, just as well as I do, Stephen. I mean, I mean, I try to unscrew a cabinet or something, and I'm making 50 trips downstairs to the garage to get the right drill or the right exactly. bit. Exactly. And these guys go in, boom, boom, boom. That they had, they? they had, they had enough equipment to uh, uh, to, to get the, the paintings off of their hinges, off of their wall placements. They worked hard. There was one small um, print uh, by okay. uh, Rembrandt, a small print of himself uh, that was c- encased uh, in a in a holding. And it, it took them some time to get that out, uh, but for whatever reason they wanted that, and uh, and and they got it. It's not a big item, uh, but it was the uh, they took one big 
portrait of Rembrandt down from its holding in the Dutch room, and uh, they left it uh, sort of uh, leaning up against the uh, against the chest because it was just too big. They could not get it out, and they just couldn't carry it. So, uh, which That's tells us, you know, it all goes to it's kind of remarkable all the details that have been assembled um, from reporters uh, in the museum has put out. Uh, but it goes, it, you know, in the end, it all leads to the investigation. What do we know about this? Who was out there who could have done something like this? And there was, and that's what I started to work on, is to try to figure out who steals art and why do you steal art? And uh, the one person who had a, a legacy of war in Boston who had done art thefts uh, was a uh, was a guy named Miles Corner, still alive. Um, uh, and Miles had done uh, several uh, art thefts, including, as his book uh, Out of the Heist points out, a theft up in Maine, uh, in a small town in a Maine, uh, in a state up there, that was owned by the Woolworth family. You know the Woolworth. Yeah, absolutely. And that, in that, and he and a partner broke into that. Uh, estate, and they stole five Wyeth, and uh, uh, N.C. Wyeth, the father Wyeth, uh, paintings, and um, and the they brought it down to Boston, and Miles thought he had found the perfect fence, and the perfect fence again turns out to be a perfect FBI agent, who nabs Miles, and Miles is about to go to jail for eight years. Uh, and Miles gets his gang to break into the, this is about 1974, to break into the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts. They're carrying guns, and they get a Rembrandt off of the wall, and they steal it. And Miles, a couple of years later, probably 75, tells his lawyer, tell the feds if they'll give me a break on that main theft, that I will uh, get them back the Rembrandt. And they, you know, no one knows that Miles has got it, and Miles does have it, brings it back, thinking he's going to get a get a break. He gets no break. He gets eight years on both the both the main case and the MFA case, but he gets them to serve it as one sentence, one eight year sentence. And out of that case, gets this belief in the bad guy world, as I did my reporting. It's a get a, a painting like that is a get out of jail free card. The feds right. will deal with you. You know, you mm. can get you can get what you want. You got a brother in law or a lawyer or someone who's you know, needs to get you know, shifted from one prison to another or needs to get a break on their case, find a find a get an art piece and give it back and you'll get a break. So and I worked on that idea and Come to find out in Miles' book, who's his partner on the main theft but a guy named Robert Donati, D-O-N-A-T-I, now the late Robert Donati. And Robert Donati, in 1989, had a friend who was in jail. He was a small-time uh, thief, uh, Donati was. He was involved in uh, one, you know, one deal after another. And he got arrested for uh, some uh, uh, financial transactions in the 80s, gone to jail. But the big, uh, 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 the big uh, uh, cloud in his life was the head of the gang that he was a member of, uh, the Russo Ferrara gang. Vincent Ferrara had been locked up in November of '89, and my reporting in my book it, uh, details this. Ferrara was visited in jail by um, by Donati, and Donati tells him, uh, "We're going to get you out of jail. We are, um, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to pull off a robbery." Ferrara tells him, "Don't get involved. Do not get. I'm not involved in that. Don't get me involved." And but that's my sense is somehow Donati was uh, was behind this theft. Uh, unfortunately, Donati uh, was brutally murdered in 1991, and uh, so whatever he did with the the art, if he was involved, let me say. But it's not just you know whatever he did with the art theft. 
uh, whatever he did with the art pieces, uh, died with him. But it's not just Donati, is it? You'll, you'll right, see there's a whole cast of the, characters. The whole cast of characters. Uh, the uh, authorities announced in 2013 that they believed that a fellow named Robert Garenti, uh, they didn't use his name, but they said Garenti was a, a Boston hood uh, who had been arrested for uh, bank robberies in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and gone to jail, uh, that Garenti was involved in this theft. And before Garenti had passed away in 2004, he had handed over, over the best of the artwork to his great friend, Bobby Gentile. And Bobby Gentile is a small-time hood, still alive, living in, um, living in um, uh, outside of Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, the feds get told this story, and they go down and they knock on Gentile's door in May, outside, excuse me, outside of Hartford. And he says, yeah, they said, we know you're involved. Just give us back our paintings. No one will go to jail. We want our paintings back. And we know you have them. And, you know, they're bluffing him. Uh, but uh, you can't bluff a bullshit artist like Gentile. And uh, the Gentile says, I don't have them. I was interested in finding them because it's a $10 million reward. But I never had them. So, uh, well, the feds set him up in a crime that because he's a... You know, he's not very swift. He falls for it. And they put him in jail. And the next thing you know, they're raiding his house. And they're raiding his shed. And in the shed, there is a false floor. And hmm. the, they, they, they open up the false floor. And they see a couple of ditches or a ditch. And in the ditch, there is a big uh, Rubbermaid uh, bin. And at that moment, this is in May of 2012, the feds believe. They're going to find the um, the artwork. They thought that they the in the bin was the artwork. They opened the bins up. There was nothing in there. So uh, when he got out of jail, uh, I, I interviewed him. I went down to his house in in in, uh, in, uh, in Hartford, and I sat with him for five hours, six hours of interviewing. And you know, he acknowledged a lot of stuff about his interest in gaining the artwork back. But he swears he never had the artwork. Is he lying? I don't know. You know, at the end of our interview, he asked me, uh, what is he going to get out of it? He given me a lot of information, good details, nowhere else and uh, that, that are in the book. And he said, um, he said, what do I get out of it? giving you all this information. And I said, I'll tell you, I tell you, you want, you, you will we'll write a bestseller. You tell me the truth and we'll write a bestseller and you get half of the proceeds. And, uh, you know, you don't, you don't, that's right. not how a reporter works. You know, a reporter sort of asked him all the questions during the five hour, previous five hours. But he had denied, denied, denied everything. Now, now that he wanted, was thinking about money, I thought maybe I could, could find another way to get him to open up. So I said, you know, I don't know what happened. I don't know how you got them or what happened to them. Oh, you know, did they get, did they get damaged somehow? And the, right. they had right. them in the pen. Yeah. So you know, tell you, me the you, truth. You mentioned, go ahead. You tell me the truth, right. and I shit. You know, we'll get your lawyer in here right now, and you'll sh shake my hand, and we'll write a bestseller, and you get half of the proceeds. And, and he you, puts you, his head down. Might, yeah, right. you know, he looks at me, and he puts his head down, and I think he's thinking about what I'm telling him, and I think he's gonna maybe he's gonna tell me the biggest right, secret right. I've ever reported. God, as a reporter, but he put his head up and he says, shook his head. He said, no. The, the, the authority screwed me, you know, they, they set me up on a crime and I never, sh I never should have been so stupid to give anybody a gun or sell anybody stolen stuff, which he had. But so they, and they set me up and, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I deserved that yeah, time, but I didn't deserve to be set up. Right. So and he said, I got nothing. I tell you the truth. I didn't have it. And so he, he was interviewed last week, uh, uh by a oh, wow. Hartford TV station and he's saying the same thing. Denying, denying, Same denying, thing. and so Jesus. Uh, the, so here we are, thirty-one years later now, and uh, we still don't have uh, the secrets to this crime, and right. it's ridiculous, you know, because this Steven, is I, I, the greatest art theft in world history. Right, in the, the history. paintings that belong to the museum, but also belong to the city. She wanted right. that art for us. Right, and, right. Uh, that's it's the, the holy grail. That, it's the, it's holy, the grail. holy grail. 
and you've got bad guys up and down the sea, up up and down the East Coast, looking for trying to get, you know, trying to get someone to tell them a secret. And all these years later, no secrets have come out. So I say there's a different way of getting at this this crime. Right. They're getting at, I, I, and that's let me ask you. This let me ask you. Outreach. Let me ask. Let me let me just get this in, Stephen. Um, sure. There was a reporter named Mashburg or Mashburn. I could be wrong. No, no, Matt. So he goes. He, he, he yeah, he goes. He goes to Brooklyn, New York, because he, with the guy Young. I, well, he never I says. He, he says forty minutes outside of Washington, which I don't think it was. I think it was in. Okay. Brooklyn. Go ahead. Okay, so he goes down to a storage facility, and this gentleman says to him, I, I, "I'm going to show you the paint, one of the paintings. I, I believe it was a Sea of Galilee. Could be wrong." So he sees it, and then he goes back to the museum and says, "You know, remember that we also, if my audience out there remembers." The front page of, I believe, it was the Herald or the Globe or both. Uh, We've seen it. I, that's how I got on the story because we had got out. Okay, the Globe. The, the Globe. Candy kick that uh, the Herald had. We've seen it on the front page with a with a picture. You know, not from the from the uh, from the uh, from the storage facility, but of, of what the painting had looked like. Right, uh, right. Not from the story, but you know, when it was hanging on the walls. And I mean, that was a shocking big break for. That was a big, yeah, that, right. That's my point. It, it, that was huge. That was huge. Huge story. Huge story. But and as how, it how turned did out, how did they find out that that it, how did they find out it wasn't that they didn't have it? Well, it, you know, it it's uh, I got Tom to sit down. You know, Tom and I were big competitors. We were on the globe. You know, we tried to keep it civil, but it you know we pretty pretty both pretty um, hmm. aggressive reporters. And Tom, uh, I asked Tom. I told Tom. You tell me the story the best way you can tell it. He said yes, and in my chapter, uh, on the whole chapter on this, Tom tells of going down there, uh, following the fellow's name. His source was a guy named Bill Youngworth, who owned a antique shop in Boston. He was a friend of Miles Connor, the uh, art thief. And Miles says, "I'm going to go to the gallery." So he brings him up into an early morning, you know, before dawn. Uh, brings him up to the room of the, the eight-story high uh, storage facility, and they open up one of the units, and they walk in. And as Tom says, there was uh, several uh, big ro uh, empty rollers um, I I that you put canvases in, and he went right. to one of the rollers, and he took out a canvas. He held the canvas over his head, and it unfurled. And there... He only he says I only was allowed to see it for a flick of an eye, a flick of a of a, of a flashlight. Flick it on, flick it off, mm. Th wow. that fast. But he said what I saw to me looked like the storm of the Sea of Galilee. Could and and that's on that basis he went with the story, and uh, the museum got excited, and they started. The feds got excited. They thought, well, Jesus, let's get the Young Worth, because he's got it, and Young Worth wanted a lot of uh, conditions met, including the, the then I think it was five million dollars uh, 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 reward put in his bank account before he provided oh. any of the artwork. Uh, uh, you know, because he was saying I can get all the artwork back, and the the feds wisely said, "No, you got to give us some proof. Show us what you're showing," and he never did. They, their, their negotiations broke down. And, did he get uh, paint, paint yeah. samples? Did he get paint samples? He no? gave paint chips. He gave paint chips. Chips. Saying that they had come from the Rembrandt. And they tested the paint chips, and the chips turned out not to be from the Rembrandt, but might have been from the same period of time that Rembrandt was painting. But they hadn't come. He said that they came from the Storm of Sea of Galilee, they, that one Rembrandt that was stolen. But it didn't. They said they proved it didn't, which I thought was but, pretty, you know, pretty negative. But the way right. the, the way Tom now says, I believe I did not see it. Okay. You know, well, how can he? See, I said, how well, can he see? on what basis do you think you did not see it? And he said, and this was his uh, conversations with Anthony Amori, who is the museum's security director. And Anthony says, and others have attested to this. That painting was so lacquered, you know, right, you couldn't, right, right. you couldn't uh, roll it up 
and you couldn't unroll it. It was like cardboard. That, uh, say again? It, it was sort of like yeah. a cardboard. You can't roll it up. It was sort of like a cardboard by that. I mean, this painting would have been done in the 1640s. Right. So there's no way it would have been refinished, re, you know, more paint put on it. There's no way over the years that that could have been furled, uh, unfurled and then furled back up. Okay. But, uh, yeah. you know, the story got the Globes. And, you know, whoever listens or hears this podcast who has any information uh, should understand that uh, Boston is at a loss, has lost right. masterpieces. Right. And they deserve to be back to the city. And you may know, know something. You may not. Of course, you don't know. People doesn't know who where the artwork is. I think right. it's well, been hidden you, somewhere. You know, they, they, you know Steve, they, they may be. They may be grandkids who go up and check up their grandfather's attic exactly. or their cousins, wh- exactly. or whatever the case is. And you hear those call stories the all FBI. the time. Let me call let me ask you FBI. this: Call the museum. Right. Tell them what you know. Give it. This right. is this and, is part of Boston's history. You have. The ability to return to Boston, recover for Boston, part of right. part and of its history. Also, make the uh, also city very, grander. Also, very important, Stephen, that the, the, the FBI now cranked it up to ten million dollar reward. And you know, even if I stole the paintings and I have them in my ba- in my my living room, I bring them to the FBI. That's it. We're we're good here. No, we don't go to jail. No, but nobody goes to jail. Nobody right. goes. That's the it. FBI has said we just they just we just want them. You. We just want yeah, them. They're they just masterpieces. Want them back on the wall. That's and all. And no matter what condition they're in, these this, this artwork right. can be restored right. to some Steven, semblance and belong I, back I, on the wall. I'm on. I'm under the impression, which I even hate to say this, but from what I've read and researched, I I, I don't have any bound to, to say this, but I think they've, they've been accidentally destroyed. You don't believe that? You think they're still around? Yeah. The reason well, accidentally is an important word there, but let's say. Uh, the, you know, you do as a reporter, just like any other investigator, anybody who watches television and who done it, you know, you start theorizing. And, uh, the, but the more reporting that I did in the bad guy, in the underworld, people who steal stuff, they tell me they don't destroy anything. In fact, one of, one of the bad guys said, as I poured myself another glass of wine, you see the cork you took out of that bottle? We wouldn't, we wouldn't, if that was a good bottle of wine, it wasn't. Uh, we would we would hold on to the cork, I would hold on to the bottle right. because you never know. Right. Yeah, they're pack rats. They keep everything. Right, and, right, right. Uh, he said we don't destroy. Now, could it been destroyed uh, because they panicked? I don't think that would have happened. They would have sta- stashed it somewhere, up in some in some, you know, on the top of some roof or somewhere. And these guys know how to build heights, and they would have been. Could have been hidden somewhere. The FBI went over to uh, to uh, the Suffolk Downs uh, a couple of years ago and searched thoroughly through Suffolk Downs. There was a sense that there had been a tip that there's there had been a um, uh, someone had had a connection over at Suffolk Downs and had hidden hidden them in at Suffolk Downs. There were two big safes at Suffolk Downs and they opened up the safe and looked. I mean, the FBI has gone to no s- small expense. To try to get right. this thing solved, you, you, you uh, know, Stephen. This, so this I, is the I 20th, think they deserve a break. Right. right. To it, get this. This, it, this being the 21st century, all the technology we have today. I mean, I think the FBI needs to hire a PR uh, company to get this out to a broader audience and social media. The young kids, you know, you know well, what I mean. You know, just, you and I know about it, Mike. You're a, you're a Boston boy. I'm a Boston boy. You know, the right. Globe, the Herald, the, the TV stations all cover to the fairly well. The museum is given out information, even the FBI has held press conferences in the past. But I hear you, you know, when you go beyond Boston, you, you know, Boston, we think the world ends after uh, 128, but right. you go we, beyond Boston, me, you know, your idea for a PR, I like that idea, but what I would want that PR firm to do is put in front of those empty frames. You go into the museum now and you see not that artwork, but you see the empty frames there of where the Vermeer was, where the uh, the Rembrandts were. You know, you see emptiness there uh, with frames. Yeah, and awful, have in front awful. of those frames someone or people with large credibility in the good guy world as well as in the bad guy world. Right. Because right. secrets are known in the bad guy world that for whatever reason, even the old Omerta, Omerta uh, uh, Crap, yeah, belief yeah. Right. that you can't, can't say anything bad, that's all gone. Boston yeah, is so different from what it was 
in the 80s yeah, and 90s it, it, when the gang yeah. wasn't going. You know, we're a civilized city. We're a world-class city. Right, right. And, and if you put in front of those paintings someone like Cardinal O'Malley, who would do it, and have him saying to the outside world, right. these paintings belong to us, to our grandchildren. Our right. grandchildren aren't seeing these children, aren't seeing these paintings. That's a sin. Have yes. the, him, have someone like that saying it. I think it would stir the conscience. Right. And even of, the Pope. Uh, and even the Pope. <laughs> they asked the Pope. They, the, uh, the museum made an effort to reach to the Pope. Really? Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Hawley, who was the director, yeah, until a few years ago, and she reached out uh, through contacts uh, to the Vatican, and they 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 were considering, but they wouldn't do it because they said it's just too uh, unusual. Hmm. Um, yeah, they probably uh, got him in the. That unusual. This is hard work of the only time Rembrandt painted the the ocean. We could see what he could see, and it's so beautiful. I've, I've seen prints of it. It's gorgeous, gorgeous mm. painting. Mm. So, Stephen, last question. So, who who do Mike, you think would it? Last question, Stephen. Who do you think were the two gentlemen that rang the doorbell that night? The FBI says they know. I don't know. Uh, so I cannot say. I don't okay. know. You know, it could be any number. Uh, you know, uh, the FBI says it knows. So, uh, and I, you know, they, I don't think they held that artwork very long. I think that they got lucky and they, they, they got, were able to pull it off, but I think they, they, did, they were working on commission right. Let me and, uh, they, they handed it over to someone who had the motivation. To do it. So yeah. it's that person who had the motivation and, Read the book, you'll see. Yeah, yeah, it's a fascinating book. My audience out there, please run out and get it. It's called Master Thieves, the Boston Gangsters Who Pulled Off the World's Greatest Art Heist. You get get it up on Amazon. I've read it. It's fascinating. If you if you if you're fascinated by this crime like I am, uh, please run run out and get it. It's by Stephen Kirkjian. Um, incredible. You, you'd be very proud of yourself, Stephen. It's um, it's it's a fascinating book. A nice and um, is this getting made into a movie or anything? Do I know? Of? Uh, it, uh, it, it has been thought of a couple of times, but uh, okay. no one has uh, no one has picked up the option of of, of late. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. We'll have to work on that. We'll have to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> you go to your sources, Mike. I'm here. I go to you my know, sources, to the- right? <laughs> Stephen, this has been great, and I I appreciate your time. And um, you know, hopefully, we, we you come back on the show when we recover the artwork, and uh, we'll be we'll visit together. We'll yeah, Washington we'll do it together. Be- Boston will be more fulfilled. Yeah, our heart will be re- heart that. will be restored. It'll be great. It'll be, it'll be it'll be back. The the beauty of the city will be restored. Uh, amen. All right, Stephen. Thank you so much okay, for your time. Mike. I will talk to you soon. Take care. Be safe. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Mike. Be Bye. well, Bye. 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 All right, guys. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you like this interview, please be sure to click that subscribe button for me, and click the like button as well. Uh, Some great interviews on here. Uh, Be sure to scroll through and enjoy the Hollywood murder mystery, celebrity interviews, and mini reels as well.